I'll mute myself. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Konarski, and I am a lead educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. I want to thank you all for joining us today as we move into our second live stream for the month of February, where we'll be continuing our theme of exploring winter. If you're new here, then welcome. Along with the live streams we do every month, we also offer a really cool free virtual scavenger hunt that you can play right at home, along with an activity guide. Both of these will have new missions and activities each month. To download all of this and explore the app, just head on over to www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. This address will take you to our mission conservation webpage. And on this page, you wanna check the box off to the right that says, get the app. It's that little blue box. Once you're there, just click the download button and follow the instructions on screen. Once you have that app downloaded, create a user account and login. That way you can track all of your progress as you play along. Next, you wanna check the search bar and you wanna type in mission conservation. This is where all of our at-home missions will pop up for you to play. And now if you look a little bit further down, you're gonna see our featured missions and the most current missions are we have to offer in this area. And then the last place that I wanna bring your attention to is all the way at the very, very bottom. So scroll, scroll all the way down and you're gonna see the schedule of missions and activities. In this section, this will show you all of the missions that are currently live, including the mission we have right now, Exploring Winter. And if you click on the plus sign, it'll drop down the tab where you can find the link to the activity guide for this month. The activity guide has a craft as well as a really fun outdoor activity. And this is also where you're gonna find many of our partners missions like an upcoming Woodsy Owl one, plus all of their descriptions. Right now, I'm currently standing in front of our snow hare and lynx diorama here in the wildlife galleries, which is the Natural History Museum located here at Wonders of Wildlife. You can probably notice that both individuals here behind me are mostly white or mostly gray, and that helps them blend into their surroundings. They can do this very, very well due to that adaptation. Both of these animals are uniquely adapted to living in these regions and that they have a variety of other ways other than their hair to be able to survive. But right now, I wanna focus on that fur. Did you know that their fur changes throughout the year? Obviously, it's a lot colder in the winter, and a lot of times it's very white or very gray, depending on where you're at. To help stave off the cold and blend in better to their surroundings, both animals will grow a thick white to gray coat. While in the summer, when things are a little bit more brown and green and it's a lot warmer, they're gonna go and sport a thinner coat that is typically brown or tan. Both of these similarly, though very different, cause different effects for both the hare and the lynx, one of which is a predator and the other one is prey. So the hare is using it to stay hidden and safe while the lynx is using it to stay hidden, but for hunting. Today we'll be discussing the Bartlett Experimental Forest, which is located all the way up in New Hampshire that far northeastern part of the United States. We will also be discussing some of the local wildlife found within the forest and how those organisms thrive in such extremely cold temperatures without the luxury of a heated fireplace like a lot of us probably have. Here to talk to us and take us on a winter adventure is Ben Weimer. Ben is a land protection associate for the Squam Lakes Conservation Society. Ben, how are you doing out there today? I'm doing great, Alex. So today it's pretty cold. It was negative four degrees overnight. And so again, as Alex said, my name is Ben Weimer. And today we're here at the Bartlett Experimental Forest in Bartlett, New Hampshire. And last week you heard about our overall mission of the Forest Service with Farah and Sandy. And they talked about why we have winter here and fun and safe ways to get outside. They also introduced you to the snow Junior Ranger program. This week, we're going to build on the core values of the Junior Snow Rangers follow, including how to have more fun in the outdoors by learning about the evidence our furry and feathery friends leave behind and how they survived winter. But first, a little about me and what an experimental forest is. So I have a background in wildlife and conservation biology and land conservation. And I worked at the Bartlett Experimental Forest as part of a research team. Experimental forests are an ideal place to conduct research because there are areas that are set aside for just that purpose. 
They are outdoor laboratories where scientists and students collect data and conduct studies on things like trees, insects, wildlife, and habitat. And the US Forest Service manages 84 experimental forests and ranges across the US. The Forest Service is the agency that Woods the Owl and Smokey the Bear represent. The Bartlett Experimental Forest is one of the oldest in the country. In fact, this year, we're celebrating our 90th birthday, which makes it older than Woods the Owl, who recently just turned 50. It lies within the White Mountain National Forest and was set aside in 1932 as an area where scientists could study the best ways to grow quality trees for wood products. Many studies are still going on today, including the one I was a part of, but the Bartlett Experimental Forest has evolved into a place where all kinds of research is conducted, including studies on wildlife habitat, nutrient cycling, prescribed fires, remote sensing, and climate change. So the research I was a part of was studying small mammals, such as mice, voles, jumping mice, squirrels, and shrews. We use Sherman traps, like this one here, to capture the animals without harming them. And so we took a little bit of tissue as well as a hair sample and we tagged each animal. And in one summer alone, we caught over 800 small mammals. During all that time in the woods, I was lucky enough to see black bears, moose, deer, and many other of our songbirds and raptors that we have here in New England. So on a day like today though, when it's only a high of 12 degrees, I can't help but think about all of these animals out here surviving the long, cold, and snowy winters we have here in New Hampshire. During the summer months, there's an abundance of nutritious plants, fruits, nuts, seeds, insects, and all sorts of other food. However, these resources are short-lived. By late fall, they have almost completely disappeared just when these critters need to stay warm and have the extra calories. If you spend any time skiing or snowshoeing or hiking during the winter, you've probably noticed that you build up quite an appetite and so do these animals. Despite the scarcity of nutritious foods, animals of all sizes have developed their own strategies for seeing themselves through the winter. Today, we're going to talk about these strategies. Then we're going to build up, bundle up, and head out into the Bartlett Experimental Forest to look for signs of winter animal activity in the snow. So our first winter strategy today is migration. So some animals just pack it up and head out of town when they're going into these long winter days. And that these animals are known to migrate. So for example, many of our songbirds that breed here in the Northeast in the warmer months actually head down to the tropics for the winter. Quite a journey, right? Researchers on the Bartlett Experimental Forest have been conducting bird surveys for decades. And it's not unusual to tally up to 80 different species in a single breeding season. However, this number drops to only about 15 or 20 species during the winter months. That's because so many of our breeding songbirds are insectivores, meaning they eat almost exclusively insects. And one of those insects are caterpillars and they are protein rich which are pretty scarce during this time of year though. So they head out down south where these foods are still abundant and accessible. There are many other species, including insects that migrate, but the most famous is probably the monarch butterfly. These insects love nectar and they head south in the autumn where, where there are still flowers because right up here, our flowers disappear. 
we have eight species of insectivorous bats in New Hampshire, and three of them, the red, hoary, and silver bats, also migrate south in the fall. The second strategy we're going to talk about today is hibernation. One of the better known true hibernators are groundhogs, also known as woodchucks. True hibernators sleep so deeply that they are almost impossible to wake up because their body temperature drops to just above freezing. A woodchuck's body temperature drops to about 38 degrees Fahrenheit and its heart rate goes from 100 beats per minute to only four. By the time winter is over, a woodchuck has lost almost half of its body weight, subsisting off all of its fat reserves. So the next time you all see a woodchuck raiding your vegetable garden, give it a little bit of slack. He's only trying to make it through the winter there. Some lesser known hibernators are jumping mice. Both woodland and jumping and meadow jumping mice Unlike many other small rodents, jumping mice do not hoard or store food. During the shortening days of fall, they spend every waking moment eating as much as possible to build up fat reserves, just like those woodchucks. When winter sets in, they curl up into a little ball, as you can see in our hands there, and they go into their nests underground and sleep for two or three weeks at a time waking up briefly, and then resuming their deep sleep. Up to 35% of their small little bodies are used up during hibernation. So before I mentioned that there were three other bats that migrate. The other five hibernate and gather in caves or mines, and these are called hibernacula. These hibernacula have very stable temperatures between 40 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit and humidities over 80% because they are underground and thus insulated. There are also animals that do a lot of sleeping in the winter, but technically aren't hibernating. They go into what is called a state of torpor. And torpor occurs when an animal lowers its heart and respiratory down to a point, but these rates do not drop as much as during hibernation. Like hibernation, animals go through torpor to save energy because they slow down their metabolic processes. They don't need to hunt for food during the winter. And some of these animals include common species such, such as chipmunks, raccoons, and skunks. Torpor is especially important for females of species because in many of these torpor species, they actually have young during the winter and so they need to nurse them during that time. Finally, we come to the rest of the species out there, the ones that don't sleep in the winter or leave. These are the toughest of the tough. These animals have evolved a multitude of physiological and behavioral adaptations to survive day to day. Many mammals of northern climates have two coats of fur, a summer coat, just like Alex was saying, and a heavier, more dense winter coat. Species that do this, have this, are moose, deer, fox, coyote, and a number more. And these coats are made up of two layers of hairs. You have your, your longer, guard hairs, which act kind of like your, your rain shell or your, your jacket. And then below those is a denser bottom layer consisting of shorter hairs and provides really great insulation. It's kind of like your down jacket. And this allows moose, fox, coyote, and other species to sleep out in the open completely comfortable. If you have a pet dog at home, See if you can find the long guard hairs and denser, shorter hairs in their undercoat. Moose in particular are very well adapted to colder climates because their long legs 
allow them to travel through very deep snow with ease. Diets during the winter months are not the most tasty or nutritious. Moose must eat 50 pounds. Let me say that again. 50 pounds of twigs and bark a day in order to survive. Could you do that for nearly half a year? Before winter sets in, moose spend a lot of time browsing on these nutritious seedlings and saplings, regenerating in the new forestry cuts on the Bartlett Experimental Forest. Many squirrel species, like red squirrels and flying squirrels, store hordes of nuts, cones, and seeds that they return to time and again over the course of the winter. Like you can see here, these private caches are called middens. And these middens are commonly ground on the ground and become part of what is called the subnivian zone as the snow begins to pile up. So let's look at that word subnivian. Let's break it down. So it comes from the Latin bases of sub, meaning under, and knives, meaning snow, so under the snow. And many animals take advantage of this new habitat, including all of the small mammals and some of their predators. And why not? Six or more inches are all that it takes to trap the Earth's heat and to allow the subnivian zone to form. The temperature of the subnivian zone stays warmer than the air temperature, generally around freezing or, or 32 degrees. And so this protects species that would otherwise freeze in the exposed air. Small mammals tunnel through the snow to find caches and to stay warm and to avoid unwanted eyes from above. However, many of their predators have finely tuned senses for hearing to detect them moving around under the snow. Both barred owls and sawwat owls can be found year round on the Bartlett Experimental Forest and prey heavily on these small mammals. Foxes, bobcats, and coyotes are active all year round and use their sense of hearing and smell to locate prey beneath the snow. Members of the weasel family, or they're also called mustelids, also use their keen sense of smell to seek out the freshest tracks. So here is an entrance to a red squirrel midden and a curious and hungry fisher had visited that night. Fishers are one of the largest weasels in New Hampshire. Some of their smaller cousins include pine martens, long-tailed weasels, and short-tailed weasels, also known as ermine. And let's not forget, forget about mink. All of these smaller mustelids, especially the tiny but ferocious ermine, are able to follow rodents down their tunnels because their long, slender bodies and short legs allow them to. However, this body shape is a disadvantage in cold weather because it means they lose a lot of body heat more quickly than a round, larger bodied animal. Camouflage is another strategy some animals employ. In areas where it seasonally snows, species such as long and short-tailed weasels and snowshoe hares here in the Northeast malt from their brown winter coats into their white coats to blend in with the snow. I mentioned at the beginning that some birds migrate, but we also have many other birds who choose to tough it out during the winter months rather than head to head to the Bahamas. And one strategy all birds use to stay warm is called fluffing. And this little dark-eyed junco in the, in the upper left there is trying to stay warm on a frigid day. Birds will grow approximately 25% more feathers in the winter, and they fluff up themselves to trap pockets of warm air close to their bodies. 
They also weatherproof them with body oil so that the, they basically become like little parkas. During extreme cold periods, birds can also decrease their heart rate and body temperature to conserve heat and energy. And you might even find them huddled together in tree cavities to stay warm at, at night. Ruffed grouse, however, go slow solo and create what are called snow roosts. During periods of extreme cold, they do so by folding in their wings and diving into the snow. A grouse may stay in these roosts for several days if the weather is severe enough. And this enables them to stay warm, but also hidden from predators like northern goshawks. Goshawks are a fierce member of the Accipiter family, or forest hawks, and a year-round resident in New Hampshire. And grouse, as well as snowshoe hare, are one of its favorite foods. So snowshoe hare and their famous predator, the lynx, sport a special adaptation for moving across the snow, big feet. And these big feet act like snowshoes, dispersing the weight across a wider area, allowing them to travel on top of the snow. Lynx are starting to populate the more northerly parts of New Hampshire, but they still haven't gotten back down into the Bartlett Toronto Forest, but maybe someday. There are just some of these animals out there that are battling the winter elements in New Hampshire forests right now. We may not be able to see them, but if we look and listen carefully, we might be able to see their presence in the snow. So we're going to bundle up here, put on our skis and snowshoes, and join me for a trek into the Bartlett Experimental Forest. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. So thanks for joining us here in the Bartlett Experimental Forest. So it's a gorgeous day, a little bit of cloud cover. And so we're gonna take you out here on a woods walk to show you some of the tracks of the critters that are hanging out here, toughing it out during the winter, as well as try to identify some bird calls. So yeah, so come along with us and let's see what we, see what we can find. Continuing down the woods road that we are on, we've come across a really large, what is it, an old uh, aspen or poplar tree that has uh, blown down, as you can see. So this kind of blowdown is really great habitat for wildlife during the winter. And so I'll show you why right here. So as you can see, when the tree blows down in the winter, and then you have this snow falling on top, it creates what's called this subnivian habitat. And so subnivian just implies, this is sub meaning blow, and nivian being snow, meaning blow the snow, right? So, so this is all the habitat that is created when you have snowfall during the winter. And so as you can see in, the, in this um, first image here, you have tracks coming from beneath this downed tree, come and blow, blow it, and out into the, the other side. And so all sorts of small mammals, as well as um, snowshoe hare, as well as the, their predators, will all use these habitat features in the winter. And so small mammals being shrews, being your, your mice, your other rodents, look like voles, um, and then their, their predators, mostly weasels, are going to be using this. You might be able to hear them. There are a bunch of chickadees hanging around here. So uh, I'm gonna try to call them in here. So hang tight with me here.
And so this pishing sound that I'm making is mimicking the alarm call of a tuft tufted titmouse. And so all of these songbirds are, are, are coming and, and doing what's called a, a mobbing. And so th this mobbing effect is, is for, for uh, uh, um, essentially running off predators and saying, saying to predators like, hey, we know you're here, get out of here, you know? Y you can't surprise us. So we're still on this woods road and we've come across uh, two sets of, of tracks. Uh, both these tracks are our deer and deer in the winter are really seeking out this softwood cover because less snow comes down through all the fine needles and, and to accumulate on the ground so there's less snow to walk through. Plus I know that um, a little ways beyond here, there is a, an old regenerating cut, um, a forestry cut. And so that provides a lot of really young growth for deer to eat during the winter. As you can see around me, we are in a different habitat. And so we're in a, an old clear cut that had been put in about 32 years ago. And what has come up since then are these pioneer species. So you have y your birches, your cherries, and can't quite see it here, but, but there's um, aspen over here as well. And so those three families are, are going to be the species that, that you're seeing come in first. And so they're called pioneer species, right? Pioneers as in um, the first ones to, to colonize. So in particular, I wanna talk about aspens. And so aspens provide a really vital food source for one species in particular, and that's ruffed grouse. And so ruffed grouse are going to be keying into these regenerating stands for specifically those aspen. And actually, we've actually found their tracks right here. So let's, let's see them. So here you are, ruffed grouse tracks. And actually, has a little snow roost right here. This is really unique to see. A really great find for us today. And so these snow roosts, which actually you can see a small little feather in there, these snow roosts, they're actually tunneling into the snow so that, so that they are completely surrounded and encased in snow to, to, to shelter them from winter storms um, and also from, from predators. And so this is their, one of their um, winter strategies for, s for surviving these tough times. So our luck continues today. We have found more gossok food, AKA snowshoe hare. And so they're, they're moving across um, the snow because they have really big feet, right? And they, they splay out the, their toes to really create more surface area, to stay on top of the snow. And so let, let's see their tracks. And so what they're doing is that they're, they're first landing on, on one of their forefeet, which there, and then their second forefoot lands there and then their hind feet actually come in front of their forefeet and land one, two at the very front. So this here, right, is a, a spruce and snowshoe hares and, and grouse will use the area underneath these branches, which are weighted down in the winter from the snow as winter cover. Uh, to the side of me here, up into the canopy, we have a mature beech. And this guy is special because it's really being selected by bears 
and I'll show you why. If we look up into the canopy there, you can see, if you follow my finger, right above my finger there, it's what's called a bear nest. And so what the bears are doing is they're climbing up the tree. Also, one point, never run from a bear and especially never climb a tree because they are much faster than you. Anyways, so they're climbing the trees and they're going up into the, the, the notches of the branches and they're pulling in these small branches that have all of the beech nuts on them. And they're kind of like ripping the branches clean of beech nuts and they stack the branches actually underneath them so they create these like nests almost for, for themselves up in the canopy of these beach. Skiing along, it's getting dark now, but I finally found some mustelid tracks. Uh, mustelids are the family of weasels and so these are most likely fisher or marten. I've been looking for them all day. So here they are. This is a set of four, but you will also generally see them in these staggered pairs, like that. And then here, you can see there are three, but then there are two again. And it keeps going off into the woods here. Oh, actually, you can see it would pro probably marked this tree and then kept going and it was probably focusing around these boulders and around the downed log there. And as I spoke to before about the Subnivian habitat, where all the small mammals are really um, trying to shelter under, these predators are also focusing on those areas in order to have a better chance of finding the, their next meal. So as I'm walking out here, I, I want to make a, a note about bears again. So bears, which are right eating all those beech nuts, are really relying on those for building up their winter fat reserves, which they're going to be uh, relying upon when they're uh, going through torpor in the winter. And notice how I say torpor instead of hibernation, because bears don't do a, a, a true hibernation. A true hibernation um, is done by uh, some mammals such, such as jumping mice, as well as woodchucks. And so for a true hibernation, the body temperature drops, the heart rate drops significantly. And um, they aren't totally uh, dormant for the entire winter. Uh, animals that are hibernating are actually kind of coming back, or, or th their, their vitals are on kind of ra ramping up, um, spiking up uh, every so often just to keep their, their tissues uh, alive and healthy. Now bears go into um, a lighter stage of that. So th their heart rate is, is dropping, their body temperature is dropping a little bit, but it's not, not that significant compared to true hibernators. So the day's coming to an end here. The sky is getting a little bit of a yellow glow to it as the sun is setting. And we've been out here for the whole day really just enjoying the, the majesty of this forest here. So today, right, we've gone through uh, a number of tracks that we found, um, how to identify some key features of the tracks, as well as talking about the animals themselves. And so, right, all these animals out here, uh, especially the mammals, have to tough it out through the winter. And so, as we've discussed, they have a variety of strategies to go about doing that, right? You have some of your species like bears and, and some small mammals that are just kind of sleeping out the winter. And then you have your, your tougher animals like your, your deer, your mustelids and, and canids and um, snowshoe hare, which are roughing it out on, on the surface, um, finding browse every day. And then you have your birds, which are Right, the birds that stay here, your chickadees, your 
small songbirds, your, your um, goshawk like we saw, barred owls are also toughening it out and right puffing up their feathers to give themselves a little bit of insulation on some of these cold nights. And so all these animals have all adapted to this habitat and they're all keying into specific features on the landscape. And so knowing how to read that is a really special treat and, and really offers you a, a whole nother world to, to delve into out here. So I encourage you, use some of these strategies that, that we've talked about today. Uh, and I hope that, that we have kind of inspired you to go out there on your own and explore and, and appreciate and respect these animals out here. So thank you so much. And we really appreciate you guys coming along for this woods walk. Well, guys, thanks again. So all these mammals, birds, and insects that we saw today all have their own unique survival strategies to see themselves through the winter. So we encourage you all to explore your backyards and find those hidden treasures that wildlife leave. So now we leave it up to you all to explore safely and to respect and appreciate our wild neighbors. So thank you and back to you, Alex. Ben, thank you so much. That was awesome. I definitely want to get out there and get into that into that forest now. I mean, that was amazing getting to see all of those different things, all those different aspects. You've been able to call those birds in. That was crazy. I'd love to have been able to be there to really hear all of it and take it in. But as we end our live stream today, I would like to thank everyone that tuned in to be here with us live and all of those that may be finding this video later down the road. I also want to give, of course, a very special thank you to Ben, his entire team out there, as well as every wild adventurer and conservation advocate out there helping give our natural wild world a helping hand. If you like today's program, please show us support by giving us that big thumbs up on the YouTube page there. And if you'd like to know what we have coming up in the future and want to stay in front of all of our live streams, just subscribe below and you'll be able to find all of our awesome videos from past lives, as well as have easier access to those yet to come. Our next live stream will be on February 22nd with the Sawtooth Avalanche Center. As we sign off today, I of course wanna challenge everyone to get outdoors, advocate for conservation and help be a voice for all of our wildlife friends. We are so lucky to have this wild world all around us and it's up to everyone to protect it. This is Alex signing off and I can't wait to see you all next time. Stay wild out there. <laughs>